everybody. So in today's lecture, I want to apply Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, and we're going to look at what it's like near the surface of the Earth and maybe some other planets too. So let's get started. So as a reminder, in a previous lecture, we defined Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation as the following. The force between any two bodies with mass would be equal to minus g times the product of the masses, m1, m2, divided by the center to center distance between the masses, r squared, and then times r hat, where r hat is a unit vector that points along the line connecting the two masses. The negative sign indicates that the force is attractive. Now here, big G is the universal gravitational constant, and the value of that gravitational constant is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. So what we're going to do today is compare that force from Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation to the force of gravity here on planet Earth. Now we had a pretty simple equation for that that was introduced in a previous lecture. The force of gravity, the magnitude of that, near the surface of the Earth is just m times little g. m is the mass of the object that's near the surface of the Earth, and g is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. So if we equate the magnitudes of these two forces, mg and big G, little m, big M over r squared here, okay, then we can look and see that we can solve for little g, the acceleration due to gravity. To explain a little bit about the nomenclature here, the little m is the mass of the object, like the little person that's sitting here on planet Earth right here, okay? So it's the mass of that person, right? Little g is, as we're going to see, I'll solve for it, 9.8 meters per second squared. Big G is the universal gravitational constant, 6.673 times 10 to minus 11 in SI units. M sub e is the mass of the Earth, and R sub e is the radius of the Earth squared. Now let's think about why I plugged those values into this equation. Remember that from Newton's law of universal gravitation, it was the magnitude, big G times the product of the masses divided by the center to center distance between the objects squared, okay? So one mass is the mass of the person standing on the Earth, and the other mass, since there are two bodies attracted to each other, one's the Earth and one's the person, the other mass has to be the mass of Earth. Now the center to center distance between the person and Earth is the radius of the Earth. Okay, as you can see here, we're standing on this big old sphere here, right? And the distance between the center of our bodies and the center of Earth is approximately the radius of the Earth, okay? All right, so having looked at that, what we can see is that both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation contain the mass of the person, little m, or whatever object you're looking at. And so that cancels out, and that means that you can solve for g. This is why the acceleration due to gravity of objects near the surface of the Earth is the same regardless of what object it is. It could be a piano falling or it could be a person, but they both experience an acceleration due to gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared in magnitude, okay? So plugging in for those numbers, what I would do to solve for little g is I would multiply 6.673 times 10 minus 11 in SI units times the mass of the Earth, which is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, and divided by the radius of the Earth squared, and the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. So if I plug and chug in there, then you can see that you get 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's why the acceleration due to gravity is what it is, right? And you can show that this law of universal gravitation is equivalent to the knowledge that we already have about the acceleration um, here on planet Earth. Now let's say that we're not standing right on the surface of the Earth, but instead maybe we're in an airplane or a spaceship or something like that. And we're some distance h, say, above the Earth's surface, right? And it's a significant distance, not like the distance in between my feet and my hips, okay? So we're talking a, a, a good chunk of height there. Well, what would happen is that the center to center distance between the two bodies would then become the radius of the Earth plus whatever your altitude is, right? So if I call the altitude h, then that would become r sub e plus h, right? 
and that changes the acceleration due to gravity that the body experiences. In fact, it reduces it in magnitude, right? And then the further and further away you get from the center of the Earth, the higher and higher you get up in altitude, the lower that acceleration due to gravity goes. And as your distance from the center of the Earth goes to infinity, right, your weight, mg, or your acceleration, little g, would go to zero. And this makes sense, right? If you're infinitely far away from the, the center of the Earth, you're not going to experience much of a gravitational force at all from it, right? So that makes sense. You can actually measure this, okay? And you can measure it without getting an airplane and without getting in a spaceship. It turns out that the acceleration due to gravity does vary a little bit depending upon where you are on Earth. And that can be due to the altitude, like maybe you're on a mountaintop or something. Or it could be due to the shape of the Earth itself, which isn't quite spherical. Actually, the Earth is an oblate spheroid, which means it's kind of smushed out near the equator, right? It's fatter at the equator than it is at the poles. Okay, so what that shows us is that the North Pole um, acceleration due to gravity here is larger because it's closer to the center of the Earth than it is at the equator, right? So at the North Pole, it's 9.832 meters per second squared, but at the equator, it's more like 9.78 meters per second squared, right? Just because you're closer to the center of the Earth. And if you were on Pikes Peak, for example, right? then your uh, acceleration due to gravity has been measured up there to be about 9.79, okay? All right. Oh, by the way, they measured this. One of the things that they noticed is that it changed the period of pendulum clocks. That was one of the first things that they noticed, right? Because the period of a pendulum clock is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G, where G is the acceleration due to gravity. So your clock, your pendulum clock, actually gets uh, off a little bit if you change altitude. Let's do an example problem here. Let's calculate the free fall acceleration on Jupiter. So Jupiter's radius is 6.99 times 10 to the seventh meters. It's a lot bigger than Earth. And its mass is much bigger than Earth, 1.9 times 10 to the 27th kilograms. So if we plug in using the same equation that we did basically for the Earth's acceleration, g, I'll just call it g still, right? Um, except maybe I can refer to it as g sub j so you don't get it mixed up with 9.8, okay? So the acceleration on gravity would still be uh, the gravitational constant big G, which is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 in SI units, times now the mass of Jupiter, which is 1.9 times 10 to the 27th kilograms, divided by the radius of Jupiter squared, which is 6.99 times 10 to the 7th meters squared. When I plug and chug all that into my calculator, I end up with an acceleration due to gravity on the surface of Jupiter of 25.9 meters per second squared. That's huge, right? That's actually 2.6 times the acceleration due to gravity on um, Earth. So we call that 2.6 g's. It's really important that you don't make the mistake of mixing up the two g's. It would be easy to do, right? So big G is the universal gravitational constant, and it's a tiny number, 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 in SI units. It's tiny. Whereas little g is the acceleration due to gravity, and it's a normal size number, 9.8 meters per second squared here on the surface of Earth. But it does vary by location. However, most of the time for the problems um, that you're asked in uh, introductory physics courses, it doesn't really matter too much that it varies, okay? Now you might be asking, okay, so I saw that the acceleration due to gravity drops off as I go up in altitude, and I understand that the acceleration due to gravity would go to zero if I were infinitely far away from the planet. But if that's the case, then I would still have some acceleration due to gravity, even if I were in outer space in orbit around the Earth. So why do astronauts experience the sensation of weightlessness when they're, say, in the International Space Station or something, okay? So let's talk about that, all right? When things go into an Earth orbit, like when we're on the International Space Station or we some, send satellites up, what happens is they're actually constantly falling in towards the center of the Earth. That's what an orbit is. They're given a tangential speed, and their tangential speed is pretty high, right? And the tangential speed as, uh, assures that they move over right, fast enough 
so that they don't lose altitude as they fall in, so that they're constantly moving around, right, in, a, in this orbit around Earth, okay? So it's a balance. We'll talk more about the math behind that later, but just understand that because it's moving in a circle, it moves over as it moves down, and that puts it in a circular orbit around the Earth. But it is constantly falling in towards the center of the Earth, so it does experience gravity. So it's kept in the orbit by its speed, it's continually falling, and Earth curves away beneath it because it's a sphere. So if you were to pull Earth away suddenly, if Earth suddenly vanished for some reason, then it would continue on, this object would continue on in a straight line path. It would be like whirling a ball in a circle, right, with a string, like a ball attached to a tether, and then you cut the tether line. And what would happen is the ball would go off in a tangential path straight, right? So objects in orbit are said to experience weightlessness, even though they have a gravitational force acting on them, okay? And this is because anything in orbit is constantly in free fall. So they don't experience any normal forces, right? They're not pulled down because what they're standing on is falling too. So if you can imagine the very terrifying scenario, right, that you're in some kind of elevator and the uh, cord or uh, cables that hold the elevator up are suddenly cut, then the elevator would fall and you would fall and you would experience this sensation of weightlessness because you're all falling together, right? Well, it's the same thing for things in orbit, okay? So this is apparent weightlessness. It's not real weightlessness. If you were to find the value of F is equal to mg, it would be non-zero. So you would still have a force due to gravity acting on you, which is weight. Even if that gravity is reduced because of your altitude, it's not zero. But you can simulate weightlessness when you're like jumping or in a free fall situation, like these folks are. And this is actually what they do for astronauts when they're in training. You can watch this video, I've put the link here, it's a lot of fun, or you can just uh, type in vomit comment and look at the things that come up on YouTube. What they do here is they take um, an airplane and they take it in sort of a parabolic trajectory. And so at, for a few seconds at the top of that parabola, you experience the sensation of weightlessness and you're floating. And that's just because you're falling, you're cresting and you're falling and you don't feel any normal forces acting on you. And it allows the astronauts to get a sense of what weightlessness is gonna be like without really leaving Earth. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, learned a little something. And if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll see you in class.